Um, I'm from Essex. I'm from West Essex. I was brought up on a bit of land in between the east end of London and Epping Forest. And the reason I'm telling you that is because in my early years, as a, uh, sort of before I was a teenager, I watched the M11 and the M25 plough through countryside that I'd learned to love, countryside that my mother had introduced me to and my brothers had allowed me to play in. It was a, a delight. So from a very early age, I was aware of the fragility of the nat so-called natural world to such an extent that actually when I was about eight, my mother said she thought the only natural world left in the UK would be our national parks, which was quite a scary thing to tell an eight-year-old. Fast forward to now, and I'm an architect. I could have been working for Greenpeace. At the moment, I'm glad I didn't take that, that decision. <laughs> so, can architecture matter? Well, what do architects do? What do we like doing? We like doing these sorts of things. That's the Bird's Nest Stadium in Beijing in 2008. In 2006, I was working on a school extension in Sussex. We actually had to pre-order the steel for the extension before we knew who was going to build the building because all the steel and resources were going east. And we knew that in two months' time, the price of steel would go up 30%. If any of you in the audience want to go outside and order some block work now, you won't get it. There isn't block work at the moment. We're suddenly in an age of growth over here, and the construction industry is also in growth, but the, we don't have the resources. This building's a bit more interesting in a way because it's the neighboring building to the Bird's Nest Stadium we're just looking at. But it's made of plastic bubbles, a lot less material. It's basically plastic bubbles that inflate if the building needs more insulation and deflate if it needs to cool down. There's hardly anything to that building. This is a bigger building again, nice and scary, designed by Rem Coolhouse, who's probably the most influential, clever architect out there at the moment. This is the main CCTV building in Beijing. It's all about oppression and communication or controlling of communication. There's a little tower block to the uh, left of that. That's a hotel for journalists. One thing I'd also advise you... <laughs> one thing I'd also advise you is if you want to uh, celebrate the opening of your building with a fireworks display, don't. <laughs> That's the day that building opened. The fireworks uh, organiser is still in prison. Rem Coolhouse has got another gig. What can architecture do? You know, is it important? I did a talk a few weeks ago, and uh, someone said to me, but this talk's all about politics, but you're an architect. What's that got to do with it? This is 1933. This is the amazing Karl Marxhoff that still exists in Vienna between 1919 and 1933. Red Vienna, as it was called at the time, built 360 housing estates for people that had never had houses before. Wonderful places to be. This thing is a kilometer long. It's got 1,300 flats in it, but it's also got a, um, a forest school, a nursery, laundry, cinema. It had all of that in 1933. It's not just housing, it's places to be. It also only occupies 18% of the, the plot. It's like a big castle. Then the fascists move in in 1933, and they literally bombed it because they knew where the communists were. Oh, back to England. This is what we do with housing now. This is an advert, or actually it's an article from the Evening Standard, for an advert that was um, uh, placed abroad, boasting that this housing, which is yet to be built in Stratford East, London's Olympic leg legacy, would not include social housing. Don't worry, there will not be poor people there. The antithesis of Red Vienna. The hidden con consequences of architecture, the stuff we don't want to talk about. This is an easy statistic to get your head around, though. For every five houses we build, the equivalent in waste of one house goes to landfill. That's how we build. We always overorder. We always order 10% more carpet, tiles, paint, whatever you want. At the end of the day, we throw a house away for every five houses we build. Back to the Bird's Nest Stadium again up there on the left, and the other image on the right, Qatar World Cup. The uh, people involved with the construction of those stadiums, we might cause 4,000 deaths. We don't hear about how many people died in the construction of the Bird's Nest Stadium, the hidden consequences of architecture, the managing of resources. It's really important if you're an architect to know the uh, materials you're working with, the ingredients of the thing that you're cooking up, and to know where they come from and the consequences of them. It's a rainforest anywhere. That's illegal mining in a rainforest anywhere. That's a close-up of an open-cast copper mine anywhere. There's only one 
ethically sound copper mine that I know of, and if someone in the audience knows of more, please tell me, because then I've got an option to specify copper from that source. That is a sea of humanity in an open cast copper mine. A lot of them are underground and even scarier in a way. You try building without using copper. And now, there's another ra race to get fossil fuels, whether it's in the Arctic or in Sussex. And what I find amazing is that we're in this sort of post-green age now where our right-wing governments, they tend to be the right-wing ones, are actually encouraging us to burn our way out of recession. Now, this happened after the Second World War as well. In London and around the UK, we were asked, or my grandparents were asked, to burn coal overnight in their fires to get the economy going again. What we got was 25 years of smog. Now, I say, unfortunately, this is, uh, this is sustainable design. It's actually from a book called Architecture Without Architects, which a lot of my clients asked me to read. And <laughs> this is, I know it. I've read it. This is amazing architecture. This is architecture from the second largest city in Pakistan. Buildings made out of the soil beneath the feet of the buildings, adobe buildings. The, cons the environmental uh, consequences of that place, it gets so extreme that actually even in the summer, it's so hot, these walls don't keep you cool. So they have these, uh, air sh these little air uh, wind catchers. That is an example of a, a lovely stable shelter and an amazing vernacular architecture born out of harsh constraints without a drop, of, a drop of fossil fuels being burnt. This is the stuff we like building still. This is the Sterling Prize winner from 2005. It's the Laban Center. It's an amazing building. It's very successful. It's in Deptford. That polycarbonate plastic facade has ended up in the Deptford Creek three times so far, to my knowledge, every time it gets a bit too windy. Now, my best friend uh, is the project architect of that building, and he told me, unfortunately, that the green stuff got value engineered out of that. They couldn't afford it. But they could afford Michael Craig Martin uh, choosing the colors of the uh, facade and doing some murals inside. Then I got these slides at a conference a few years ago from someone called Dusty Gedge. That is the roof of the Laban Center. The image on the left shows the former cr uh, concrete building that was on the site, broken up and put on the roof of the new building. They upsized the structure of the building to allow that load. That load on the roof stops that building overheating. Add a bit of soil and you've got bees and flowers. Now, what, that is amazing because the black red start actually happened to be in Deptford. Depth, That's a bird, a rare bird, and now it's got some extra places to be. But I thought what was most amazing was that my project architect friend didn't see how, didn't describe that to me as the green strategy, because most people think green architecture is insulation and solar panels. Now, this is just to remind us that we are, have only one planet. Now, if everybody in this room here, or sorry, if everybody on planet Earth consumed like we do in this room here, we would need four planets of stuff. So it is all about resources and understanding the size of our ecological footprint, which is the sort of negative burden that each of us or society has on the natural world. We don't talk about ecological footprint too much. We talk about carbon, and we're preoccupied with carbon. But the great news is, and these are a couple of images stolen from Herbert Girardet's wonderful Gaia Atlas to cities, is that actually... Chinese cities up until the early 1990s, and they were huge cities then, acted as sustainable cities. The waste from the city fed the hinterlands that fed the city. Now, I normally ask people to guess what this is, but I won't for this talk. But if you get one thing from my talk, remember the two words, rural studio. They're based in Alabama. They're a school of architecture, and they are a practice of architects as well. They build buildings, and this is a church for very disenfranchised communities and people in those communities. And they do it, their final year students get to design a building, then they have to make the thing. And they have a budget of $15,000 per building, which is not a lot of money. So they have to beg, borrow, and steal. And this is a church where the lovely uh, glass uh, wall there, and this is from about 15 years ago, is made of car windscreens, 85 Chevrolet windscreens. This is a tower by Shigeru Ban that's made out of cardboard rolls. He does other st structures as well. Now, what you can learn from that is there is no th such thing as waste. There's just stuff in the wrong place. And that principle has really inspired a lot of the work 
that I've been working on in the last couple of years, and I just want to talk to you about two projects very quickly. Weirdly, it's the same project done twice. In 2008, uh, Talkback Thames, who used to produce Grand Designs, wanted to do a special program called Grand Designs Live. And what we did is design and construct a prefabricated house out of wholly com compostable material. And we did it in six days live on TV. And it was proper jeopardy. We didn't know if we could do it. Now, the idea was that normally with prefabricated construction, it's a good thing because you reduce that 20% waste on site. You can actually have a zero waste on site building. The bad news is that they use a lot of petrol or uh, petrol sourced, petroleum sourced materials, plastics, polyurethanes, those sorts of things. Now, what we did with this project is use this sort of stuff instead. Interestingly, the systems I'm going to show you were all designed by architects. Architects that were trying to lock carbon instead of burn it. Architects that were trying to create replenishable circular systems instead of linear ones dependent on oil as a source. So these were the ground floor <coughs> walls um, made by a system called ModCell, which is expensive timber frame, but very cheap material inside. And obviously, in this case, it's straw. We also had reeds. We, we, we had thatched walls. And then upstairs, we had a lightweight system. And this is where we married uh, contemporary technologies, a flatbed CNC router uh, with a straightforward, simple material, a sustainably gleaned um, ply. And we made these boxes. And they were so accurate, they were, they were cut within a millimeter. So again, there were no, was no wastage. And these boxes went together and formed the upstairs walls and ceiling of the house. And then those boxes were filled with waste paper insulation. Now, because we got this lightweight bubble, we were going to be prone to overheating. So we put a rammed earth wall in the middle of the house to, to uh, help moderate the internal in temperatures. Now, that meant that we didn't have to have air conditioning using that lump of earth. And these are a few shots from the inside when it was completed. And we actually did it in five days because we did day one twice for the cameras. <laughs> I hadn't got makeup on on the first day. Those bottles we collected that form the shower enclosure, we collected over a week. It was a hot week in uh, May, and we used those as the wall. But this is a building that took six days to make. And apart from the glass, everything was compostable. And it, oh, actually, one of my favorite things was this chair we had, which expanded out to be a sofa if you've got your friends around, and it's made of cardboard. That was one of the first examples of an integrated solar roof. So it's not, so, it's not tiles plus solar panels. The solar panels are the tiles. And there's Kevin at the end of it all. And we had 4,000 people in this building in two days. But then it got uh, taken down. So I was a bit disappointed because I thought, oh, we'd be great as a resource because I'm a, a teacher as well. And it would be great to have it in Brighton. These two slides are about how accurate this was. This was all made off-site, no cutting on-site, no wastage. The only waste on-site was the plastic bags, bags the windows came in. And though those external louvers are different sizes. They're coming together at an external angle, and they're meeting exactly. Everything fitted. And that's, that's high-tech stuff for you. That's where it works. It was the UK's first A-plus rated house, but again, it was only up for two days. But it locked carbon. We've, be, we've got a big rush to burn carbon at the moment. People are buying log burning stoves because it's good to burn. It ain't good to burn. We were going to rebuild the, the house that Kevin built, but we couldn't get the funding quick enough. The house got dispersed around the country. So we were then given the opportunity to build it again. But this time, we, that's a photo montage. This time, we called it the Waste House. And that's the Faculty of Art in Brighton. Now, the reason we wanted to call it the Waste House is because we wanted to prove that waste is a valuable resource. And I also bumped into some people who were saying that, actually, at the moment, there's a lot of large companies that are looking at avoiding the, the buying of raw materials and the avoiding the throwing away of stuff. So this linear metabolism we're used to, which is finding stuff, turning it into something, and throwing it away. Nowadays, throwing away is costing money. Finding raw materials is costing money as well. So if you can stay in the middle, you're going to make more money. So we got our students designing construction systems, and then we started on site. We got a large local contractor, Mears, to be the building contractors. But we've also done it in partnership with City College, Brighton & Hove. And to date, we've had nearly 700 people involved in the construction. 
So this is coming out of the ground with the foundations. Ironically, we were on a landfill site, so we had to dig a big hole, get rid of the rubbish, recompact it down with waste chalk. Low carbon foundations. Uh, I'll tell you one day why they're low carbon. And then the rest of it is stuff we've salvaged from the construction industry. So block work. This is amazing. This is a three-story workshop just near where I'm speaking. Uh, City College have a three-story three workshop. Every year, their carpentry and building students build a house. They take it up and take it down. This year, they're not taking it down. It's a permanent thing with us. So we started thinking about building the house out of uh, ply because we'd built some pavilions with students and found second-hand ply really easy. That was our first mistake because last year it rained for 12 months, so the ply we were getting was all super saturated and delaminated. But eventually we found some second-hand damaged ply and we made these columns, and here it is going on site. We filled the columns with waste polystyrene. That's insulation to me. To other people, it's TV packing cases. And that's the insulation going in. These are the beams. This is one of the City College students talking about the beam is just made. And it's a big collaborative thing, and we're making loads of mistakes. These guys have become Mir's apprentices because of the work they've done on the waste house. We're getting school visits as well. So when school kids come, they're bringing CD covers and toothbrushes. At any one time in Brighton, there's probably a million unused toothbrushes. And we're using these plastic materials as the insulation for our house. And this is a, a ram chalk wall that we've made. This is the sort of stuff we're making the house with as well. That's broken up polyurethane, really expensive insulation. It was just thrown away. We got hold of it, broke it up, and it's in the walls of our house. <laughs> Has everybody cleared, uh, cleared those out of their window, out of their uh, lofts? Because uh, we've got millions of them. And uh, we've also got CD covers from uh, shops that have gone bust recently. This is from a couple of weeks ago. Kat Fletcher, who's sourcing our materials, found out that Gatwick Airport uh, every flight has uh, they give away uh, free toothbrushes. There's 25,000 toothbrushes we've used on the waste house. Denim. We found two tons of denim from a company that sells denim waistcoats and denim shorts out of pre-made denim jackets and denim jeans. Vinyl banners. There's vinyl banners up at the moment. We're using them as permanent vapor control layers on the house. This is a pavilion our students made in the summer. It's been dismantled. It's part of the house. It's another project we made out of waste. It's dismantled. It's part of the house. And there's the team. Now, I've got six seconds. And what I just want to tell you that is if... This is something. I'm quoting Neil B. Chambers from Brooklyn. I had a problem a year ago. He got his feet wet in a hurricane. Now, the problem is... <laughs> that was Neil. <laughs> I'm not going to misquote you, mate. The issue is, if you're designing something and your design team tell you that the green version of what you want is going to cost more, tell them to try harder. If they can't, find someone that can. Green design does not need to be more complex or definitely not more expensive. Thank you very much.